All right, welcome back and brace your brain for a download from a really smart mind. Vivek Wadwa joins us now, and I'm honored that he's um, he's here. Vivek is a, a tech entrepreneur. He's a, a distinguished fellow at Harvard. He's a professor for Carnegie Mellon in Silicon Valley. He's the author of Your Happiness Was Hacked, Why Tech is Winning the Battle to Control Your Brain and How to Fight Back. And thanks so much for being with us, Vivek. Let's start with Elon Musk and Twitter and the email that you sent out to your troops on November 14th. It begins this way. Quote, and this is Vivek talking, guys. I expect that all of you are watching the greatest, parentheses, clown, parentheses, the greatest clown show on earth. Elon Musk self-destructing as he destroys Twitter. There are many management lessons to be learned here on how once great leaders fail. Close quote. And wow, here I thought Elon Musk was doing great. The Twitter files, you know, election interference, FBI pressure. So, so the fact, tell us, what is he doing wrong? Dennis, to start with, let me uh, uh, set the stage here that I've known Elon for more than a decade right now. Uh, when New York Times was attacking him, I was writing for the Washington Post. I was a syndicate, globally syndicated columnist of the Washington Post. I was defending him. My first article said, uh, talked about me being uh, a Tesla fanboy. I declared myself a Tesla fanboy. Article after article, whenever he got attacked, I was defending him. And uh, Elon also got me my, my first Tesla out of turn. This was many, many years ago, 2012, 2013. Um, there was a 6,000 person waiting list. He got me bumped up and I got my Tesla. And then uh, he persuaded me to get my new Tesla, which was supposed to have full service driving in 2016. Um, and you know the autopilot stuff. So I've known the guy, I've been out drinking with him. Uh, we have many common friends. And I used to call him the greatest innovator of our time. When the, uh, the, the right was attacking him for his clean energy, and for you know uh, being into solar and all of this stuff, I was defending the guy vehemently, right? So okay. now suddenly he's decided, okay, I'm now a conservative, and I'm going to suck up to all you know the right wing people and so on. It's still the same Elon, the guy. You know, um, the, you and a bunch of other people may believe that he's a he's a god now because he's saying all the right things you want to hear. But Elon is Elon. I mean, he doesn't have conservative values between sex and drugs and um, all the other things he's into and the fact that one of his children um, um, his daughter um, is as a transgender and she disowned him she divorced him okay these are christian values these are the things that you folks uh, you know look up to uh, china he dare not say he's all into free speech he dare not say out of one negative word about china for, because he's going to offend them and it's going to demolish his uh, stock uh, price. The free speech is only for countries that happen to have free speech where he can speak freely. He dare not speak against any of the authoritarian regimes. The guy is uh, uh, nothing like what you know you and a lot of other people are touting because he happens to be releasing some emails. And also on the emails, wait until he starts releasing the, the emails that the Republicans sent him or he gets into lawsuits and he has to release those. Suddenly he's going to become, uh, he's going, going to go from being a god to being a demigod. <laughs> okay. So um, I appreciate a, a lot of the, your points. None of them were in direct response, though, to what, what my opening question was, was in, in terms of Twitter, in terms of what he's doing to the platform and management lessons, what is he doing wrong? But before you answer that, let me just say that the guy's worth two hundred billion. Like you said, he he's the first car company in a hundred years to challenge the big three. I believe he doesn't his Teslas. They out, actually outsell um, his, as a luxury car. You know, BMW and Mercedes Benz that have been around for decades and decades. I mean, the guy is like Larry Ellison said when he put. $1 billion in January, 2019 into Tesla stock. And they asked him, why would you do that? The short sellers are killing, the, killing him. And he said, hey, he's sitting rockets up in the air and taking them down and landing them on barges. No one else is doing that. What have you done? So I kind of want to root for him. I kind of hope that he does. Dennis, I'm the guy who was defending him from the conservatives for the longest time. I was intent, the one who was- uh... to open up the platform. His intent is not to, to ruin it. His intent is to open up the platform. So what has he done wrong at the platform since taking over a few a month ago? Okay, so far Twitter hasn't crashed. We haven't seen any disasters yet, but they also haven't released any, any new code. It's all frozen. Now, um, what he's done is he's demolished the company. 
uh, it, it's fine. I mean, uh, uh, to have gotten rid of some of the you know extreme uh, leftists that uh, I, mean, uh, I used to uh, say that it was the the um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the um, the lunatics who were running the asylum. I mean, uh, that's what Tuta has been. Okay, it was fine that he got rid of all those extremists, but what he did was that he just got rid of everyone en masse, so that now he has a skeleton crew. And you know, even uh, verified, he hasn't been able to release that because he's demolished the company. That's not how you take over oh. companies. Okay, you but have I, to. If I may, I, I talked to a guy who goes into workout situations all the time, and he was telling me he's very technically inclined and he knows a lot of this stuff. He said, "There's no way they need more than a few hundred engineers to run that. You can't monitor 240 million people's comments with with people. You're doing it with algorithms anyway. So the question is, how good are they? And when he fired half of that staff of 7,500, let's remember two metrics I love. One is they were spending the equivalent of $400 per meal on employee meals at the base because everyone was." working from home, but they kept spending and spending. And the second is, I was astonished by this number. Is it, is it high or not, Vivek? The median income level for all of these employees, the uh, median income level was $240,000 per year. Isn't that high? Dennis, welcome to Silicon Valley. That's the way it is here. I mean, ridiculous okay. salaries, ridiculous benefits. Uh, but the trouble is that when you, you know, uh, uh, take over a company, you get rid of all the dead wood. You don't start by slashing all your best people. So the best people who left and, and the H-1Bs who can't leave, you know, these foreign immigrants who can't leave because they're yeah. on these visas, they stayed, all right? A lot of the, the best talent has left the company. And and he, he brought his Tesla engineers and his SpaceX engineers, but you can't just go there and just because you know how to write code and say, okay, I, I can write code, but you, you know, uh, we haven't seen the damage, you know, that he's exactly. done to the company yet. It's still early in the cycle. They also did host a space, what do they got, spaces or something, this live chat. And it, I believe it hosted, I, I think I read a, a people. million people or something. No, all it was not other people, but the key developers of spaces have left. All right. So now if he wants to upgrade spaces or if something goes wrong, he's in, he's in big trouble. I mean, don't you think that his code and his coders are, are better than whatever Twitter had. I mean, that when, when he got in there, meet me here at uh, this time, bring code you've done in the past month. You shouldn't be here if you haven't done code in the yes, past month. What you're just saying right. is it's like saying, I've got the best football team and they're going to go and play great basketball. That's how it is in coding. You have to know the, the right languages. You have to know the architecture. You have to know how All the right. system works. You can't just go throw smart people at it. Okay, so so far we haven't seen any bad impact of that, but he's getting lots of criticism for everything he's doing there. You've been out with him. You know him socially. He's done personal favors for you. So let me ask you, and they say, by the way. Well, I've done and, personal favors for him, okay? He did it because okay. I had uh, you know done so much for him. Well, so you guys have a relationship. Therefore, I think you know him better than I do since I've never read him and I only read about him and the same for every, the rest of us. So now let me ask you, and you're never supposed to when you're an anchor or ask a question you don't know the answer to. And you and I haven't rehearsed any of this. Um, do you think that he is a racist white supremacist who is out to change Twitter into a platform for that? No way, Jose. Absolutely not. Are you kidding? Me? Uh, my first book, Immigrant Exodus, uh, Elon readily endorsed it. Okay, the, uh, the book touted uh, the power of immigration and talked about how we need to bring the best and brightest in. Uh, uh, Elon's CFO, Deepak Ahuja, was a good friend of mine, okay, Indian guy, okay, but he elevated him and he gave him carte blanche to do what he had to do to, you know, help him build uh, Tesla. Elon is not a racist by any means, okay, he's not a white supremacist by any means. None of those things are true. The trouble is that Elon is consuming too much, um, um, too, too many drugs, I mean, or drugs of all kinds, and they're eating away at his brain. And he's surrounded by people who are taking advantage of him. I mean, the fact that he spent $44, $45 billion on Twitter, it was vastly <laughs> overpriced. I mean, uh, yeah, Twitter was worth $10 billion at the at best, if even that much. Okay, and, and these people didn't care about his money. It was his money they were spending. And they basically, you know, rah, 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 b b b whispered in his ears. And he's only he's surrounded by a bunch of yes men who are giving him stupid information. And he okay. listened to them and he's believing his own press. Okay, by the so same press. By the same token, let's remember a couple of things. He put in his bid, I think, about in April before the market really started falling apart. The market was down a good, I think, 20 percent. 
and any bidder would want to try to foul up the bid and and uh and and pull out and try to redo it because the stock that you would use usually in an acquisition has gone way down in value so that's the first thought the second thing is the thing no one else realized and i wrote a column for this in the wall street journal actually plug um you know he saw it much and you know this i'm sure he sees this as the everything act x.com he wants people on twitter not to just screaming each, at each other and centering each other or whatever he wants them to start paying each other and 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 doing transactions and companies and and clicking on ads and buying things far more i mean the potential upside there is huge and his, he was it, trying to build a super app okay and first of all uh, he had a one billion dollar walk away fee from twitter if he was smart if he you know if he had the right people advising him if he listened to investment bankers instead of these idiots that he hangs out with and i know who the idiots are frankly they are i used to hang out with them also for a short while okay so if he he would have paid a billion dollars walking away fee yeah i would have hurt his ego he would have looked bad and then he comes back in so okay now you're uh, you're worthless i'll offer you 12 billion dollars for this thing negotiate he didn't do that ah. i mean that's an awfully good point, Vivek. You walk away, you take a billion dollar uh, fee, but then you come back and you ask for. You ask uh, again because uh, he would have destroyed it in the price. meantime, and he would have gotten a bargain for it. If he had bought it for 10, 12, 14 billion dollars, he could easily have doubled the value of it. Yes. Now, what is he? He bought it for 44 billion dollars. You think he's going to um, increase the value to uh, 250 billion dollars? Not in our lifetime. So the, the trouble is that he got really bad advice. Elon, uh, Elon at heart is a brilliant entrepreneur good person at heart okay but like i said right now he's being misguided by, by it's the people around him who are the problem uh, i'm so happy that you could join us vivek thank you so much vivek wadva for sharing your thoughts with us and man guys i'm gonna do everything i can to make sure he comes back okay <laughs> Thanks, my friend. have a glorious day vivek okay Any, anytime you invite me i'm ready and we're back you know what i'll, I'll tell you that talk with vivek wadva is gonna make news. The guy was hurling balls of fire. And next up, I got a great guest for you to meet. Ed Butowski is a wealth manager out in Texas. He was a 20 year veteran on Wall Street advising others and, and how to manage their money. The guy oversees hundreds of millions of dollars and other people's money. And I was delighted to be able to meet him some years ago when we did a book together that I helped him write called Wealth Mismanagement, in which he makes this basic argument. Wall Street, you suck at managing and assessing risk. And so now he's here to talk to us today in the wake of the FTX scandal, where they managed to lure money not just from a million crypto kids, but also $1.8 billion in the past year or so from SoftBank, Sequoia, Paul Tudor Jones, Tiger Global Management, some of the biggest names on Wall Street. Thanks for being with us, Ed Butowski. What do you owe that to? How could this happen? Well, I'll tell you, by the way, you left out BlackRock, which uh, you know is a, a firm that a lot of people have viewed as the you know, quintessential, if I said that right, uh, mm -hmm. firm uh, at managing money and taking care of risk. And, and that's what I love to talk about is risk management. And this has everything to do with people just blindly following something that they didn't understand. And they just threw tons and tons of money at this and literally accepted on face value what this 30 year old kid was saying to them. And that's not any way, you know, that's not traditional wealth management uh, risk assessment. That's just, you know, plain, just, you know, common sense that you do a little more homework uh, on yeah. where you're putting your money and where you're investing. Talk um, about due diligence in this case. And, and, and were there warning signs? Well, I'll tell you, the warning sign was that that they didn't have the auditor in place. They had a very small auditing firm. And the other side of it is, is that they didn't have controls over what they were doing with their money. So a lot of this money was, you know, either, you know, up, you know, as absconded or they they took the money yeah. and and loaned it to this Alameda uh, hedge right. fund. And they I mean, didn't I, have I, I, I've, I've been writing them. a few. I've been writing a few columns on this, and, and and it is rather stunning what they were doing because you had this, you had the platform, and then they issued, you know, a couple billion billions of dollars in their own coins, tokens that traded on the platform by the hedge fund Alameda, run by his girlfriend, you know, who loves Harry Potter. We heard about from Forbes magazine. No controls, no board of directors. That accounting firm, the auditing firm you mentioned. I read this. They they are proud to have the the be the first accounting firm with a 
and address in the media verse and they sponsor the dcl uh, baby dolls this scantily clad group of of performers that's their accounting firm now the wall street firms the big investors and the vcs they had to know this right why did they invest anyway yeah because this is a new area where people just thought that you know here you have this young person who's making all this money and was you know sort of the the stronghold in that space and everybody just wanted to believe you know things and and they continue to believe you know even though they yeah. didn't do their due diligence you know there's always one firm out there that looks into these things and i'm sure there was one firm that said that this was all a farce and 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 it turned out to be correct the same thing with madoff i mean there's a lot of similarities to madoff here where well, people there just is, isn't there returns and and they Tell just three similarities well, one of the similarities was the accounting firm. Uh, and, and you know, people just believed the returns as well without looking into what those yeah. returns were. Um, the accounting firm and and also you know the hoopla uh you know you had everybody talking about Madoff as though he's his you know darling Genius. of Wall Street and and the same thing yeah. with uh you know Sam uh, Bankman Freed uh he was supposedly this incredible guy he even went out and uh you know put money with uh uh, Anthony Scaramucci and in and, and you know Scaramucci supposedly was a really smart guy and Scaramucci Very savvy $800, investor 800 million dollars in crypto and his firm has gone from about 7 billion I believe in assets under management to about 2 billion uh, oh and, and that's not all because of crypto but when you start hearing about you know Anthony Scaramucci is in bed with this guy and all these other firms Tiger and 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 uh Blackrock is in in bed with him you just start to you know blindly give your money to this person and what really got me is my son actually had six thousand dollars with uh BlockFi and BlockFi uh his money's gone I mean my son's money is just yeah, they just gone. Filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection, right? That's right. And, for, and for those listeners who don't know you, when, you, when, a, when, when a company files for Chapter 11, they're saying, hey, man, we're going to work out a plan to pay off, pay off our debts. And you creditors now are unable to sue us in court. And that's exactly what FTX did. And, and, and that's what they're in the, the process of working out now. Um, here's a thing that surprised me. All right. So this is a this was a, a platform valued at a high of $32 billion a few months ago. It falls to less than a billion in assets. It owes nine billion to other people, including a million investors, right? Um, but I did not expect it then to wipe out 200 billion in crypto value. A lot of them are down 90%. And then it goes all the way at, into my retirement account, my IRA at Fidelity, where I bought Grayscale Bitcoin, GBTC. Now, I can't buy Bitcoin in my retirement fund, but you can buy that. I thought it was a pretty solid fund. Turns out it's run by a guy I interviewed when I was on CNBC, Barry Silbert. He was this brilliant billionaire, young guy who did this first thing called second market where people with private companies and options, they were able to kind of sell it into this market. You couldn't sell it on the regular market because they're they don't count. And so instead he created that. And then NASDAQ bought that. He then creates this great credibility. GBTC, my GBTC from the highs down 82%. What was I thinking, Ed? So how did that happen? Well, you didn't listen to me because um, <laughs> I would have told you to stay away from it. Now, in terms of these ETFs that are in your uh, for your IRA, you know, the, people want to say that, you know, these are separate and they are separate. Bitcoin and Ethereum are separate from FTX. But I'll tell you, it does have that smell of crypto. They trade as one, I, don't they? They yeah, all trade together. Right. So a lot of people believe that Bitcoin will be back and Ethereum will be back and some of these other coins will be back. So, you know, I certainly wouldn't be selling those. Uh, but but, you know, you're talking about one being an exchange, the other being, you know, what is traded on it. Uh, right. And, you know, so oh, in fact, you, you, and to, you know, Wall Street analysts did not uncover this. You know, when I was doing a lot of research on it, here's what I found it. November 2nd, that's before the November 6th tweet that went out on a Sunday morning from the CEO of the rival platform called uh, Binance, where he said, right. I'm dumping a half billion in this FTX coin over here. And then everybody in the football stadium tried to get out one doggy door all at the same time. That's what, what happened here, right? Um, but I forgot what my point was, where I was going with that. Pick it up. 
Well, in, in, in respect to Binance, you know, you, you talk about a run on the market. And that was, you know, any investment you can make that has that much risk to it is not a good investment. You should never be in anything where people can run oh, out the door and, and kill the value of it. That's what I was going to say is that for it to fall and tumble 90% in days that if you've, all right, so Facebook has lost a lot of money. It's lost, you know, 70, it's down 60% and it's hundreds of billions of dollars, but there's still something there. And it took a long time to do that, that it falls overnight like that tells me that there's nothing underlying it in intrinsic value holding it up. It's because yeah. it's crypto based on nothing, right? Well, that's the way I feel about Bitcoin and Ethereum. Although people tell me Ethereum is a platform that other things are built on. But I will tell you that I, I believe Bitcoin has no real value. Uh, and, and the only reason it has value is because people you know, assign a value to it. But there is nothing backing Bitcoin. That's why some people you know, have said it, you know, crypto and Bitcoin is the greatest you know, scam in history. And I'm not well, that far from it. I got to tell you, as an, the uninitiated and as an uh, unsophisticated investor in all things crypto, it always bothered me that there are these people with computers, servers, and they're doing, quote, mining as if they're out there digging for stuff. No, they're trying to to unencrypt this really tough encryptable equa equation so that they can make some of that stuff. But if you're making it and anyone can make it, if only they can burn enough electricity to to unwind the code. It's just something weird. To even call it mining is to act like it's something real, like you're grabbing something physical. Gold is something physical that you mine for. And in the entire 5,000 years of gold, I think we have literally three or four Olympic swimming pools. That's all we've come up with. But this is nothing. That's right. It's, it's almost like taking an ice cube that, that is crypto and then melting it into water and then it just disappears, it evaporates. And that's what this can do. That's probably a pretty good analogy to what crypto really is because there is nothing there. It just becomes air. And, and I believe in the long run, especially when uh, regulation comes into play, that Bitcoin's gonna become worth zero. It's just that. I was talking to another really big guy in this area the, the just today. And if there were a collapse, a default by the U.S. government, because, you know, our U.S. government's been paying $350 billion a year, roughly, in interest, no matter how big the debt was because of our zero interest rate policies for the last 10 years. But now interest is going up to over a trillion dollars a year just on interest on our debt, right? Well, if it right. were to keep going up, the U.S. defaults, the entire world collapses. Now, I think personally that the entire world will then flood into the U.S. as the one least risky place and so that we'd be OK. But this guy was saying, no, then maybe would you go into crypto? Would you want some off the books or away from that banking system? Would you want something you know, away from J.P. Morgan being able to tell you we're not going to allow you to use your account to, to buy a gun? You know, what about that? Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I, I, I would say that if you look at the correlation between uh, the stock market and crypto, they're highly correlated to each other. So it's just so the if, same thing. If everything with no, went to, with no one, uh, intrinsic value beneath it. Right. And, you know, so I would be buying diamonds. I'd be buying gold. I'd be buying cans of uh, green beans versus putting money in crypto. Huh. And, you know, there is this fear of missing out angle, right? Because, you know, you say that. And then suddenly something soars 70%. It's just that don't clients, which do, do, which do your clients get more upset about? Missing out on some opportunity that soared or instead going into something that then plunges or goes down significantly? Yeah, people, there was a Harvard study done that people are two and a half times more emotional about losing 10% than they are than of making 10%. So people get a lot more emotional about losing money than they do missing out on making money. So when um, it's down 10, they feel like it's down 25. Yeah. And, two and, and a half times as right. bad. And enough. then they turn to people like me and say, my goodness, what have you done to my life? And they're like, my goodness, you know, the market's down 20%. You're only down 10%. Uh, I didn't do anything bad to your life. And, you know, over time, you know, things have a way of, you know, resuscitating uh, and coming back. But you know, to have the money in crypto, there's no real reason why this is going to come back. I know some people who are analysts on crypto, which I don't know how you become an analyst on Bitcoin. Um, but these people claim to be analysts on Bitcoin and yeah. saying that it's very cheap right now. Well, yes, well, Sam what? Bankman Freed, understand, I, I wrote a column and I pointed out that Fortune magazine did something like 
six stories and the five stories in the first six days of August of, uh, of, of earlier this year on Sam Bakeman Freed, quoting him on all this brilliant stuff. And one thing he said was that Solarum, S-O-L, this uh, crypto, that is by far the most undervalued, best stable coin out there right now. I got to tell you, it's down 98%. So, and yet they were treating him like he was this oracle and this soothsayer. And the broader market, let me ask you, well, I got you here because I remember something that I learned from you when we were working on wealth mismanagement, your book. You come out in the book and you say, everyone tells you, oh, 60% stocks in your portfolio and 40% bonds. But basically, bonds are terrible. They've never kept up with inflation, not for 40 years, and no portfolio should have one. And yet we always do it because it's supposed to counterbalance stocks. What happens, folks, is that when stock money leaves stocks and those those prices are falling, it floods usually into bonds. And when you send the prices of bonds up because there's more uh, dollars flowing in, it makes effectively the interest rate go down, right? I believe I got that right. Yeah. And so what, what happened this time is that the market peaked in November 2021. And then huge declines in NASDAQ, especially because it was up far more than the S&P 500, but also bond prices fell. Where was yeah. the money going, Ed? Why did that happen? They should have well, been going up because money should have been flowing into bonds, sending prices up. And instead, bond prices fell with stocks. How rare is that? It's very rare. In fact, if you go back to 1928, we've never we've only had four time periods where they had stocks and bonds both down in the same calendar year. But this is the only time they were both down more than 10% in a calendar year. In fact, they're both down about 15%. So this is very, very rare. But in terms of the 60-40 split going back into wealth mismanagement, the idea there is that bonds rarely ever keep pace with inflation and taxes. So anytime you could get 4 or 5% on, uh, on a bond, the reason you can get that is because inflation has pushed it that high. And then when you take taxes out, you've lost purchasing power. I actually just redid the numbers the other day through November 2022. And if you went back to 1995 and bought uh, one-year CDs or uh, money market or you know, them. So one-year right. bond, you lost 0.91% purchasing power. That's after- Of the 1% that, that you were- uh, Nine point. Wait, what does that mean? I, you lost zero point nine one percent of purchasing power. That is, you were behind each year by that much. That's right. So well, you're so, supposed to be earning a percent or something. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So even if you were earning, so there were sometimes, in, you know, since 1995, you were earning five or six percent, but because of inflation and taxes, you lost on average point nine one percent. So you never have a good reason, unless there's liquidity needs where you need money in a six-month period, should you be in fixed income. Okay. Except if you're buying senior rate floating notes and business development companies yes. and preferreds, because those pay an extraordinarily high amount of interest. Okay, but the other day, my Fidelity advisor called, wanted to uh, find out whether I was interested in some bonds, because short-term bonds have really kind of spiking high rates. In fact, Everyone worries about this inverted yield curve, right? And supposedly it's a predictor of recession. And that what they mean by that, guys, is that you should be able to get higher interest rates for tying up your money for 30 years because of fears of inflation or whatever, than rates for tying up your money for only two months or for one year, right? I've got right. But what happens with an inverted yield curve, that what they mean by that curve is if you look at it on a big graph, like a fever chart or something, and instead you can get, earn more money by just committing it for only two years or less instead of uh, more than you earn on the interest rate for 30 years, right? Now that's a bad thing, isn't it? And yet for short-term bonds, why not put money into it? Well, because you're looking at those short-term bonds being two-year and, and that it starts to, the curve starts to flatten out at around five or six years. But, you know, we're also talking about a minimal amount of money. Uh, you know, you're talking about getting, you know, 4% on short-term and then you're looking at inflationary pressures being, you know, six, seven percent, and then you take taxes out. So it still doesn't make any sense, you know. E even though if you're just looking at the yield curve, it might make some sense, but when you then start to look at the real return, it doesn't make any sense. Then instead, where should that money be put right now? For fixed income type of investments, you should be looking at business development companies. They're selling at discounts to their net asset value. They're selling at discounts of about 10 to 15% of what they're worth. Plus, they're paying out about 7 to 8%. So you can buy an FSK, 
uh, which is uh, Franklin Square, which is managed by KKR. You can uh -huh. buy that at a 20% discount, make 12% on your money. And to me, that's a no brainer because you can get a value. The value of your holdings can go up. Plus you're getting 12% income. You're looking at yeah. a 20% total return. Where do you find that? Where do people shop for that kind of thing? Well, they they call me, um, but uh, but is this through private placement stuff? It's not like you can go on online and search for stuff to to invest on that. Is it? You go to bdc.com, uh huh, and and you can find a whole slew of these and senior rate floating notes as well. Senior rate floating notes are short or they're 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 notes that are issued by banks and then firms like BlackRock, Nuveen, uh, uh, KKR, Apollo. Uh, Eaton Vance, they securitize them and then they sell them off. And the interest rate that they pay goes higher as interest rates rise. So a lot of these are paying more money than they were a year ago. Now, the value of them have dropped. And that's not the case with the BDCs. Most of the BDCs are, are trading at higher prices this year. But the senior rate floating notes, for some reason, haven't traded higher. So you're getting those at really nice discounts as well. And okay. then you also buy preferreds. Um, and these, this is where you should have your fixed income money and nowhere else but those places. Okay. You know, Ed Butowski of Chapwood Investments out there in Plano, Texas. Ed, I got to tell you, that's a great, you've just done a great job of lighting a candle instead of just cursing the darkness there. Those are some really good ideas. I'm sure that my friends at Ricochet could freak out when they hear this because they're saying, oh my God, investment advice. And so they'd want me to put in some really quick uh, notice right here in which you, I should point out that that Ed's views are his own and they don't represent anything to do with what's bugging me or, and, and the podcast. And furthermore, before you make any investment decisions out there, you should do your own homework. You should seek out your own financial advisor or whatever. And don't become and blaming us for some mistake you make. Because one thing we learned in FTX, as I've mentioned here, maybe in last week's episode, is that flim flam requires the complicity of the victim. You know, I mean, I wanted to kind of get some Bitcoin into my um, retirement account, right? So that's on me. That's my fault. So if you listen to Ed and you lose money, that's on you. So there is my disclaimer. And I hope the my friends at Ricochet think that that will suffice. Ed, I'm so glad to see you. You're looking awfully good. Um, we got to get you back on for some more investment ideas, but also to talk about what it's like to go through a real rough health struggle and just keep persevering and keep pushing through because your ability to to just keep looking for that bright side instead of going with woe is me is what I think kept you alive. And so I, I would love to hear about it if you're ever willing to talk about it. I'd love to. Thank you very much for recognizing that. It's been a tough go. All right, my friend. It's great to see you. Have a glorious day, Ed Butowski, and thanks for being with us. Thank okay. you. Okay. Ricochet. <laughs> Join the conversation.